A record number of Nebraskans voted in the 2020 general election this year, despite the challenges of the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. We'll take a closer look at the results and what they mean for the future. That's tonight on Speaking of Nebraska. Thank you for joining us on Speaking of Nebraska. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. At least 936,000 Nebraskans cast a ballot in the general election this year, including a record number of mail-in ballots. Voters re-elected all three members of the House of Representatives, as well as U.S. Senator Ben Sass. And all six of the state ballot measures passed, including the expansion of gambling and limiting interest rates for payday loans. Secretary of State Bob Ebnan says election officials and poll workers across the state successfully managed a difficult election year. We exceeded our previous turnout record in terms of total votes cast, which was uh, in the 2016 presidential general election, by about 68,000 votes. Our unofficial overall turnout was 936,106, which is a turnout of nearly 74%. 34 counties had a turnout of more than 80 percent, and four of our counties had a turnout, turnover of 88 percent. 45,782 ballots were cast in all mail-in precincts. Early ballots uh, that were mailed in or dropped off totaled 436,269. 51,932 voters voted early at their county election commission or county clerk's office. Our representative democracy cannot survive and thrive without the active, informed participation of voters. Nebraskans can be proud of their participation in the elections of 2020. Joining us now, Dr. Kevin Smith, Professor of Political Science at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, and Dr. Joe Blankenau, the Professor of Political Science at Wayne State College. Welcome you both in as we look back on the election. And we want to say something right after the beginning. We're taping this program on Thursday afternoon, and the presidential election at this point has not been decided. Vice President Biden seems to have the clear path to victory, but again, this race has not been called at this point. And uh, who knows with the litigation, it may go on for much longer than it day or two, but we want to put that perspective on our conversation uh, right from the beginning. So I want to ask you both, uh, I guess, a broader question to start off with. If you had to write the headline for the 2020 election at this point, and I know it's difficult at this point, but if you had to write that headline, what's the takeaway f for you from this election? Dr. Smith. Well, I think the headline that I'd write would be unexpected, and unexpected in a number of ways. Um, the polling, at least the state-level polling, seemed to uh, be off by uh, quite a bit in the sense that uh, Republicans outperformed the polling by quite a bit. Um, I think it, even though we had hints of this, the, the closeness of the races in, 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 in some states where it's being decided by a percentage point or less, um, states where, you know, in some cases the polls had one candidate or the other up by a considerable amount, I, I think that's the most surprising thing. How about for you, Dr. Blankenau? Um, uh, I like what uh, Kevin says there. I might say uh, something like America turned out. You know, we have, uh, I think, uh, historic uh, uh, turnout levels uh, across the country and uh, here in Nebraska as well, too. So we have a country that uh, is very engaged in uh, what's going on uh, on both sides. Or, and uh, so uh, I think that's a positive. That's good. Obviously, this is a, an extremely unique election just based on the fact that it's taking place in a pandemic. What's the impact of COVID-19, or was there even an impact on COVID-19 on this election? What's well, uh, uh, interesting, uh, I was just thinking about that uh, driving down here. Um, that's another, I think, really big takeaway is that uh, the country found a way um, to get a really a strong turnout in um, in, you know, during a pandemic. And uh, I think that also speaks well to um, the states and, and everybody who um, made sure that people got out. Any impact, Dr. Smith? Yeah, I think the most obvious impact of COVID was the huge increase in mail-in balloting that occurred in this election, which 
was at historical levels. Like Joe said, I mean, we've got, I think this is the highest turnout in 100 plus years is a percentage of, of, of the electorate. I read, was reading some early figures on, on, on that. And the voting mechanism, I think, got a, you know, a significant stress test. I mean, that's an enormous amount of ballots that were coursing through the mail system and flowing into, you know, the organizations that had to count those ballots. And at least so far, touch wood, it looks like it, it all worked out. Looks like it did. Let's get into some of the specifics. Nebraska is one of two states to split its electoral college votes. President Trump won four of the five, but Democrat Joe Biden has earned the second congressional district vote with 54 percent of the vote in that district. But in the same district, voters also reelected Republican Don Bacon to Congress. Bacon has 51 percent of the vote in that race against Democrat Kara Eastman, the same margin of victory when those two candidates ran in 2018. Did you expect those races to somewhat mirror each other more, and did that split surprise you, Dr. Smith? Um, I'm not sure that it totally surprised me. I mean, Don Bacon has an incumbent's advantage, and the incumbency advantage is real, and there were some cross-party endorsements there. Um, I would have thought it would have been, I mean, it was a tight race, but I thought it would have been a little tighter than it actually turned out to be. Um, at least the last set of numbers that I looked at, at the, on the Secretary of State's website, it looked like there were 20,000 people or so that voted for Joe Biden that did not vote for Kara Eastman. So there's a significant number of people who were splitting their ticket between the presidential and, and the congressional election there. And I'm not sure what the takeaway lesson for that is. I mean, I, I guess you could argue that Joe Biden is a centrist and, and Kara Eastman rightly or wrongly, um, as viewed as a little bit more progressive and, and to the left. And in that kind of like swing purpley district, um, people were willing to go for Joe Biden and, and not for Kara Eastman. Or whether it was just satisfaction with, with the job Don Bacon is doing, um, you know, I, I think it could be uh, either one of those. Dr. Blankenau, what's your takeaway from that uh, Bacon-Biden split? Well, you know, you ask uh, whether it's surprising. I think this is uh, one example where the polls seem to be pretty uh, good. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, when you saw the results uh, um, and uh, looked at the, that in context of the polls, you weren't particularly um, surprised. I think Kevin brings up a, an interesting point, and this is something people will be talking about for quite some time, is... Uh, um, is it best to, to run somebody who's considered more of a progressive uh, in, a, in a competitive uh, uh, district, right? Um, and um, uh, I think uh, Cara Eastman uh, did well, but she didn't win, and, and I guess that's, that's the test. Uh, I think in the 2018 um, midterms, um, uh, moderates seemed to do a little bit better um, than, than progressives, uh, um, people who are considered progressives uh, did in um, in those elections. And so that will be uh, something that I think uh, will uh, get a lot of conversation uh, for quite some time. Uh, you know, I, I don't know for sure uh, myself wh what it all means, but I just know that there's going to be a conversation about this. There's been some talk nationally in 2018 and again, it seems in 2020, about the uh, suburban pushback against President Trump in particular. It seems that is a trend that that, that appears to have uh, taken place in Omaha as well. Is that how you see it too? Well, I have, I think so, you know, at first uh, um, impressions, but I can't say for sure yet. I think, um, you know, when, they, um, when we learn a little bit more, um, that's probably uh, going to be the case. Um, I think it was probably one of the more interesting uh, results in, across the country. Um, uh, I'm not sure we're gonna find too many situations uh, like that, but uh, perhaps uh, Kevin knows more about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I'm not sure if it was just totally a suburban pushback. I mean, I think one of the things that's clearly notable about the second congressional district in, in terms of the context of Nebraska, that is the congressional district that is uh, an urban district. It's more geographically compact with a lot of, lot of people in it. The, the, the big city um, uh, in the state, Omaha, is there. And, you know, you take those kind of uh, areas, their, their demographics simply te seem to tilt more towards um, uh, the, the Democratic side of the ledger. And I think what you're seeing in, in, in the second district is a, what would you call it, a purple permanence, as there's just, 
at, at least at, at, at some level, it, it could go either to the GOP or to the Democrat, depending upon, I, I think Joe hit it uh, uh, right on the head, is, is it, it comes down, I, th I think, to the type of candidate that the Democratic Party nominates there. And I want to I want to touch on that a little bit because so do you think it it isn't that the second district is going more blue it's it's kind of a purple district and is this are the results regarding how President Trump did there is that based more on the the candidate or is it based more on the demographics and we're seeing more of a shift towards towards blue yeah I mean I think I'd want to sort of like analyze some of the post election numbers um, uh, perhaps next week and have a a, a firmer answer to that. Um, I think, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's just hard to say. It, it's just hard to say. But you did talk with me a little bit about Lancaster County and going blue. Talk about that. Yeah, so one of the things that I found kind of interesting is that uh, Congressman Fortenberry uh, kind of like cruised to re-election, which is kind of what you would expect given the, the makeup of the first congressional district. But one of the things that I thought was interesting is that in 2018, Lancaster County uh, turned blue. It voted for the Democratic candidate in, in 2018. And it also, at least according to the latest figures that I saw from the Secretary of State's office, just by a little bit, also voted blue at the congressional level in 2020. So you're definitely seeing hints there that Lancaster County is turning blue. Although if I was Congress, when Fortenberry, I wouldn't be losing too much sleep because the rest of the first district is very, very red. Dr. Blankenau, yeah. what, what do you think about that? Are we seeing any kind of shift, at least in Lincoln and Omaha, to just more, more blue, or is that just the nature of the election this time around? Well, uh, I don't have uh, previous election data um, to call on. I think uh, Kevin presented a little bit. Um, I think it's probably reasonable to say that um, that we're going to uh, see the uh, well the, the rural urban um, differences I think uh, are going to be there uh, for quite some time. Uh, you get outside of uh, Lincoln uh, and uh, or Lancaster County and Douglas County, maybe a little bit of Sarpy County. It's uh, you know uh, probably I, I was just scrolling over the numbers uh, the other day. You know, probably went Trump 68 to, you know, kind of to 90 percent, uh, except for Thurston County, which is up in my area, which was pretty, pretty close. So I think that rural urban is um, something Kevin mentioned, and I think that's that's going to be really important, or has been important, is going to continue to. Yeah, and I do want to touch on that uh, at some point a little, little bit later, but I want to look now at the state legislature. Mm -hmm. The unicameral is officially nonpartisan, but Republicans uh, were hoping to pick up a couple of seats this year in District 35 in the Grand Island areas. Republican Ray Aguilar defeated incumbent Democrat Dan Quick. Aguilar won more than 53 percent of the vote in that race, but the two candidates are separated by just over 1,000 votes. And in western Sarpy County, District 49, outside of Omaha, Democrat Jen Day defeated incumbent Republican Andrew Legrand. Now, Day received a little over 50 percent of the vote and is ahead of Legrone by just 252 votes. Overall, Republicans do pick up a couple of seats, but they didn't reach that supermajority of 33, that number required to stop a filibuster. So we, ha we have redistricting to think about. It's on the agenda every 10 years, and with the Republicans increasing their majority, uh, Dr. Smith, do you expect to have that to have any impact on redistricting? Yeah, it's kind of a mugs game to predict the outcome of, 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 of legislatures. I mean, that's about as difficult to do as it is to get accurate polls on presidential forecasts. I guess I would say that I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, though. You know, you mentioned the magic number to uh, o overcome a filibuster, which was 33. And at least based on what we know right now, it looks like they're going to fall one short of that. I think it's going to be 32. But... You know, there are a number of moderate Republicans um, and the unicameral who I would not expect to hew to a, um, a, a hardcore party line. I mean, Senator McAllister is, 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 is a good example of this. And, and there are several Republicans like that who are more on the moderate side of the spectrum. And, you know, more generally speaking, although there are probably the unicameral is more partisan than it's been historically, Compared to state legislatures in other states, um, I think to a remarkable extent it retains its nonpartisan nature. And I do know that there are a number of senators that take that nonpartisan element of the 
legislature very, very seriously. And to go back to something that, 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 that Joe was saying, I think the big divide is going to, on, on many issues anyway, is going to be rural and urban rather than just Republican and Democrat. Dr. Blankenau, your takeaway from the Well, legislation. I, yeah, I agree. Um, I think the nonpartisan uh, nature of the unicameral is really helpful in um, uh, avoiding uh, uh, at times uh, kind of a nationalization of, uh, you know, uh, issues um, in the legislature. Um, and uh, I, I think that uh, that that will continue, um, even though, as uh, Kevin pointed out, it's getting a little bit more uh, partisan there. Um, because, uh, I mean, I think this is important for Nebraska because it allows us to uh, focus on issues that really matter uh, to Nebraskans um, in, in ways that aren't necessarily caught up in, you know, what's a larger partisan division. So we've touched on it a little bit. Let's, let's get into the rural-urban split. We see it in the legislature at times, and we've seen it in the election. You're lo looking at Lancaster and Douglas counties. Those are the counties that turned out for Biden. The rest of the counties, as you've touched on uh, a little bit, uh, definitely going for uh, President Trump. You've written and you've researched about this rural-urban divide. What, what are your takeaways? Talk a little bit more about it. Um, you mean like the causes or just, yeah, yeah. yeah. well, I mean, uh, <laughs> it was funny cause I was thinking, oh, he might ask that question. <laughs> 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 because so th th there are a lot of answers, uh, and I personally don't have one. Uh, but you know, I read about it quite a bit, and it, it is it is really just rather fascinating to me um, to see it play out in Nebraska, and I think maybe across the country is fairly similar. Not always, but fairly similar. Um, so some of the reasons, I mean, I think issues really matter. Um, you know, and are, can be distinct out in rural areas. Um, gun uh, gun issues are very Second Amendment issues are very. Uh, important in rural areas, and I think it kind of brings people together, you know, uh, around those issues. Um, that could, uh, you know, that's potentially uh, one reason for uh, the division that you might see. Um, just, you know, more generally, um, rural areas tend to be more uh, conservative uh, socially, uh, and uh, so, you know, that kind of adds uh, to the mix as well, too. So, I mean, we could probably have you know, a four hour discussion on that, but that's just a few that come to my mind. And with the election and with what we see in the legislature, Dr. Smith, do you see the rural urban split as being around for, for a long time? Yeah, I certainly don't see any end to a cleavage across a number of important issues to the state falling along that um, rural urban split. I mean, property taxes is, is an obvious mm -hmm. one. Um, you might even see that in something like redistricting, um, you know, after the 2020 census, I would guess that there are going to be more seats moving towards the, the, the heavier urban areas in, in Nebraska because that's where the population growth is. And that creates, you know, a natural um, uh, sort of like urban rural conflict because that's, that's power numbers in the legislature. Uh also, when it comes to gambling, Nebraska approved all three of the gambling initiatives that were on the ballot. Past efforts have failed at the petition level in the courts and also been rejected by voters. Why the change now to approve gambling? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because that was something that seemed to be approved pretty much across the board. Um, uh, Nebraskans seem to be very much in favor of, of those proposals. I'm not sure I have a particularly good answer to that. Perhaps other than the, you know, part of the, that package of initiatives was there was a, uh, some of the revenue was going to be particularly targeted at property taxes. And whether that made it much more of a, a strong sell, especially in uh, the rural parts of, 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 of Nebraska. If, if it's not that, I'm not quite sure what it was that makes it so different from sort of like previous attempts to get gambling approved. I guess the other thing was is that it was fairly narrowly targeted. These casinos can only be placed at licensed, current licensed racetracks rather than, you know, building casinos um, around the state. Dr. Blankenau, what about property taxes and how much did that play into the gambling issue or did something else play? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I was just going to add uh, that nationally there were, I think, uh, six ballot initiatives um, passed uh, on gambling, expanding gambling. So I'm wondering if this isn't just an issue that, you know, the electorate across the country is starting to, um, you know, um, be more comfortable with. Uh, and so maybe that's happening uh, in Nebraska as well. Um, 
And of course, you know, it's just, you know, there, uh, uh, there are arguments that, you know, Nebraska's losing money uh, across the borders. And so um, maybe now's the time, as Kevin points out, as we're struggling over tax issues uh, uh, to, to uh, make a move on that. So with Joe Biden earning that one electoral vote in the second district in Nebraska, do you think that means the call for a winner take all uh, motion again for the state of Nebraska as opposed to splitting the electoral votes? Can we expect to see that call rise again in the legislature, do you think? Uh, I mean, I guess I'd be surprised if it didn't happen um, because it would make sense that uh, Republicans would want to pick that back up again. Um, um, whether or not, not they'll get there, you know, I don't know. Um, they've tried, I think, several times uh, in the past. Um, it, um, you know, it went uh, with Obama in 2008, uh, but that's the only other time, I think, since 1992. Uh, I think um, that uh, it, you know, one of the nice things is it does kind of bring national attention uh, to Nebraska, which may have been one of the reasons why they originally uh, went down that road. So I guess I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, and, you know, it might be an interesting and healthy debate to have. Yeah. What do you think is the pros and the cons of the splitting the electoral vote? Well, the pros and the cons, I think, fall along partisan lines. If you're the Republican Party of Nebraska, you don't want those electoral votes split because, you know, given the, the, the current advantage in party registrations and, and the way the state votes on a statewide basis, I mean, this is a, this is a ruby red state. Um, you know, having an electoral vote turn blue if from the Republican Party perspective is not, not what you want. And the flip side of that is if you're and uh, a Nebraska Democrat, you want it to stay exactly the way it is because that's, you know, that's the one piece of joy that you might be able to get out of a presidential election within the state is there's a realistic chance that an electoral vote could go to a Democratic candidate. And, you know, I'm with Joe on this. I mean, I would see that the Republicans might make an effort to end that, whether it'll be successful or not, I, I guess remains to be seen. Well, the buzzword for this election cycle seems to be polarization to get some context on the divisiveness between opposing views in the United States. We talked to comparative political scientist Erica Moreno. She's the chair of the Department of Political Science and International Studies at Creighton University. And here's her perspective. One of the things that, uh, that I can tell you as a comparative political scientist that studies different um, political systems across the world, studies elections and studies presidential systems in particular, um, I can tell you that um, as a whole, we're a fairly, um, we're, we're scientists, right? We like to observe the world and see what the patterns are and identify and make some generalizations. As a general rule, we tend not to make big comments and we tend to be very tentative about our conclusions um, and the kinds of patterns that we see. I think for the first time in my career, uh, for sure, and possibly for the first time in, in our modern um, development of this discipline, I have seen comparative political scientists openly worried about um, the state of democracy and its longevity in the United States. And that is indeed troubling um, because we have seen the kinds of patterns of division and polarization um, in different parts of the world and they tend not to end um, on a high note, so to speak. So kind of a big statement there that, that talks about the future of our democracy and, and uh, saying maybe it's in trouble. We've heard talks in this election, claims not from, from uh, Erica Moreno, but from others about we're leading towards socialism and things like that. I want to ask you both, do you think our democracy is in trouble after what we've seen in the 2020 election? Dr. Blankena. Well, I mean, I, I, I definitely agree that there are uh, very good reasons to be concerned. Um, I guess uh, I might want to try to take a positive spin just slightly if I could. Uh, and that, you know, at the end of the day, we have to, you know, remind ourselves that a lot of what happens in our lives happens at the state and local level um, where we can, you know, we can be uh, involved in, in, in decision making. And um, so I think, uh, I think we need to remind ourselves uh, of that from time to time that our, our democracy, even though it's weathering a storm nationally, there's a lot that can play out at the state and local level that ends up being quite different. Dr. Smith, what's your take? Well, I would agree that the concerns are real. You know, some of the uh, comments um, about the elections and its legitimacy that have come out of the White House, for example, are, 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 are concerning. And, and I don't think 
we should candy coat that. But like Joe, I think I'd take a positive spin on this in the sense that, you know, it's a very divided era. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's giving the system a really good stress test. And at least thus far, the system seems to be holding fine. I'm not worried about democracy collapsing. I, I don't see that happening in the United States in the near term future. I think the Republic will soldier on. So we just have a minute or so left, and I just want to get a, a you know, relatively quick answer from you to a difficult question. Kids 20, 30, 40 years from now, when we look back on the 2020 election, what, what do you tell your grandkids? What do you tell those kids about this election? Is it positive? Is it negative? What's the takeaway, Dr. Blankenau? Well, uh, you know, I th I'm hoping it's going to be positive. I, I, I tend to agree with uh, Kevin. He's making some really excellent points that this is a really difficult time and, and uh, we're having some bumps, but, you know, it's working right now. Um, and so um, I guess I guess what uh, what uh, I would tell them is something I don't know yet, which is uh, how are we going to respond to this in the in the next six months or a year? Dr. Smith. Yeah, I think what I'd, I'd tell them is or at least I hope what we'll tell them is you guys don't know how easy you have it. Let your great grandpa bore you with some stories <laughs> of how crazy it used to be. We'll see how it all shakes out, but I want to thank you both for being with us. Uh, Dr. Joe Blankenau from Wayne State College, thank you very much thank for you. your time. And Dr. Kevin Smith from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, thank you very much for your time as we try to uh, take away something from this 2020 election and see what we can, we can make of it. Thank you both. Appreciate thank it. you. Thank yeah. you. This interview and tonight's program are available on our website. Just go to netnebraska.org slash speaking of Nebraska and join the conversation on social media. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at NET News Nebraska. That's all for this week on Speaking of Nebraska. Thanks to Kevin Smith of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and Joe Blankenau of Wayton State College for joining us. You can follow comprehensive election coverage from the NET News team and from NPR and the PBS NewsHour, plus see live results online at netnebraska.org slash campaign connection 2020. You'll also find resources and stories from our election coverage partners, American Amplified at americaamplified.org. Speaking of Nebraska, we'll be back in December for a preview of next year's legislative session. Following this year's protests over racial justice and police conduct, questions about how to address those issues are expected to be front and center when the Nebraska legislature convenes in January. Legislative reporter Fred Knapp will moderate a discussion with state senators who have key roles to play in the discussion. Watch that episode of Speaking of Nebraska on Thursday, December 17th at 8 p.m. Central on NET. Tune in to NET every day for updates on the status of COVID-19 in Nebraska. These daily news updates air each weeknight during All Things Considered on NET Radio and following the PBS NewsHour on NET Television. And speaking of Nebraska, we'll return for another season in January. Start the new year with in-depth discussions on topics that impact the lives of Nebraskans. Early next year, we'll also bring you a new documentary following local health districts as they respond to the crisis of the coronavirus pandemic. Until then, I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thanks for watching. <laughs>